Hello, everybody. Welcome to our parent workshop. I'm Katrina, and um, after listening to myself on YouTube today, I'm not going to say a whole lot because you guys are not here to hear me. So I just want to introduce our guest speaker. She is my friend. Her name's Liz. She is a labor and delivery nurse. I would say by day, but it's maybe more by night, and a homeschooling mom by day. So um, she's got four girls. And she has been homeschooling for eight years, and some of her kids are dyslexic. So she, I asked her to come and talk to you guys because I feel like a lot of the knowledge that she has learned, all of us want to learn too. So we are all lucky enough to get to hear Liz, hear her experiences, hear what she's learned. And at the very end, there'll be time for questions. So um, sit back and enjoy. And thank you, Liz, for being here. Hi, guys. So I'm going to jump right in and just share, I, have, I put together some stuff for you guys to actually look at. Maybe, let me see, hold on one sec. <laughs> let me see if I can find it again. And just let me know if you want to share my screen too. Okay. Okay, I found it. Yeah, <laughs> make yeah. it big, and then, all right, here we go. Can everybody see it? You good? Okay, all right. So I'm just going to kind of talk to you about my experience with dyslexia. So um, basically, my story, I'm dyslexic, and then at least two of my kids are, and I think the other two, honestly, have a little bit of... Um, auditory dyslexia issues. So I'll just kind of start here. Um, so, and this, I feel like this, my story is just, just that. It's just my story. Um, I didn't read until the fifth grade. I caught up a little bit when I was in sixth, but really like, I didn't, I didn't enjoy reading until I was an adult. And I just want you to like know that, like as you're working with your kids, if they're not reading, it doesn't mean that it's the end of the world. <laughs> it's okay. There's still time. Um, so, and just like that next little bit I put on the slide, um, you know, I, I managed to graduate nursing school and I actually had good grades and I didn't read textbooks. Um, it's just not ever the way that I've learned anything and I still managed to graduate college and do just fine. So be encouraged. Um, I've also worked in some of the most uh, complex areas in nursing. I've taken care of patients, um, that, you know, on ventilators with chest tubes and five ways of active drips running at the same time. And it's like, you can do anything like, you know, being dyslexic does not mean that there's anything wrong with the kid. Okay. Um, but I, definitely, um, I, I know my limitations. Um, you know, I, I still double, double check phone numbers all the time. Um, if I'm going to call a doctor, I looked at that, I look at that phone number three or four times and then I might stop and, and look again and see, make sure, make sure what number I'm telling him to call back because I could screw that one up. Um, so, and I know that the, the more tired I am, the more I do those kinds of things. I reverse stuff. I reverse phone numbers. I reverse my words. Um, I type backward. Um, so I do all kinds of interesting things, the more tired I am. So it doesn't go away. These, your kids are not going to grow out of being dyslexic. A lot of people will say that you don't grow out of it. You just figure out your tools um, and your workarounds that, that make things doable for you. Um, so definitely just remember that they're not going to grow out of it. You're just going to, you're going to equip them with tools so that, um, when they're adults, they can still, they can function and they can do all the things that they ever want to do, um, with those tools that you're providing them. Um, I still know to this day, if I want to learn something new, I need to probably listen to an audio book or I need to go to a class and actually hear somebody tell me about it. Um, because sitting and reading a textbook will never do me any good. Okay. Um, and tools, tools, tools. Uh, don't ever think that it's bad to do, you know, use audiobooks. Um, I wish that had been more of a thing when I was growing up, you know. Um, now, like every book you can find is an audiobook. So use it. That's a great thing to do. Um, 
It doesn't mean they shouldn't learn to read, but definitely use your tools. Uh, spell check is your friend, autocorrect is your friend, uh, voice to text is a great tool. Use all the things. Um, and especially, you know, as they get older um, into the bigger grades, like use them more, use them anytime, anytime that's appropriate. Um, so, and then here's just some basics. I just kind of wanted to run through um, kind of what to look for. Lots of people have this question, like, I don't know if my kid's dyslexic. I mean, maybe I'm just a bad teacher. I don't know. So um, I know I did some of that too. So here's just some things to kind of look through. Um, so basically, uh, you know, it, what you'll see is when they start to try to read a book, um, the first thing that they do is they're scanning both pages. They're looking for clues, like, what is this story about? What kinds of words am I supposed to be hearing? Um, so they're looking for all the cues. Um, and then they'll guess things that you, you might look at them and be like, what, where did you even get that word? It's not even anywhere on the page. And that, those words, don't, that doesn't even sound like anything on the page. It doesn't look like anything on the page. Where'd you get that? And it's because they've looked at the page and they're guessing um, and words like, and the for, you know, those kinds of words, they know are in lots of sentences. And if they see something that looks like one of those words that they see all the time, they're just going to guess one of those words. So they're really just like, it, they're really smart. They're just looking for anything they can use to figure out what might be there. Because reading the actual letters on the page doesn't make sense to them yet. Um, they're going to lose their place all the time because they're just looking at the words and the letter pictures. So it's really easy to lose your place doing that. Um, they might uh, see a word in one line and sound it out and work with you on it. And then in the very next line, they have no memory of that at all. Um, uh, this is a big one. This is why I put lots of stars, okay? Not being able to identify letters and or numbers despite solid repetition and consistent instruction. So if you have taught them these things and you have repeated it and you have showed it to them over and over and over and they still have no idea what you are talking about, it is not because you're a bad teacher. It's because they're not being able to make that connection. So this is the time to find new tools, not to beat yourself up, okay? Um, They'll do some really normal reversals like pot for top, bat for tap, split for slip, you know, um, or they'll just simply, you'll see them sounding out the word out of order. Like instead of sounding out um, like slip, they'll, they'll say, oh, you know, they'll get it out of order um, just in even sounding it out. Um, and one thing that I found was interesting as I was learning more about it as an adult now, um, is that they can mix up, if you if you write down a word and look at it as a picture, like the letters as a picture, like the word top as a picture, it's you can see how it'd be really easy for them to even make top into bat. Because you've got a letter that drops below the baseline and you've got a, lot, a letter with a, a cross on it. And if you just spin that word around, they look exactly the same. And they're not worried about the orientation of it. They just see the same picture, okay? Um, so, and then um, moving on here, the blank stares. <laughs> if you get the blank stare <laughs> as you are trying to teach them, um, then they're, they're probably just super frustrated, okay? The, I don't know how many times I thought my kid wasn't listening to me, like, hey, pay attention, I'm trying to teach you. Like, look at me, listen, why, why are you not hearing me? Um, it's because they, they've given up, okay? So, and I want you to notice, this is where my kiddo was at when I finally figured out that we were dyslexic, okay? Um, and I'm dyslexic, and that's how long it took me to figure out what was going on here. Um, so when they when you get to that point, if you have a kid that's just staring at you, just like they they you're speaking Greek at this point, um, then it's time to time to drop back, find some new tools, and start fresh, um, and lots of building up. We did lots and lots of you know rebuilding confidence and um, just 
pouring into my kiddo again, like you're a smart kid. Look at all these things that you're really great at. You know, look at all of these amazing talents that you have. Uh, you know, dyslexia is not a bad thing. Um, and lots of people, that's a side note, lots of people will argue about, you know, whether or not it's good to label it and say, oh, they're dyslexic. Should they know that they're dyslexic? Should we say that just that they're dyslexic? Um, and I'm all about it. I, that's personal opinion. I think it's good for them to know. Um, I think it's a lot easier to have something to hang it on um, instead of just feeling like, well, I just learn different than everybody else. Like, gosh, everybody else understands. I don't. Uh, whereas when you, if you can pinpoint and say like, you have dyslexia, like this is a real thing. And, and, and it makes you know, it, it goes with all of these kinds of struggles, but it also goes with all of these cool gifts and ways to do things that are different than, than maybe other people will see the world, you know? So if you can, I, that's where I feel like the label can be handy is being able to, um, to encourage them, really. I feel like it's an encouragement. Other people will tell you different opinions on that. So find your, <laughs> your what you decide is fine. Um, so, and back to this, sorry. Um, They'll also, they'll say words and syllables out of order. Um, you know, all of my kids um, say that they're prosticking. I don't even think I can say the word correctly anymore. They prostic things. <laughs> so um, nobody, nobody practices anything, they prostic. <laughs> so, um, and that's something, you know, they'll, they do that to lots of words. That's just one that we hear a lot around here. Um, but just saying the syllables out of order. So it's even, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but but there is a big auditory component to dyslexia. Um, so this next one goes along with it. Um, they'll mistake sounds. They'll think that g is k. Because if you think about it, those are very similar. And if you can't differentiate that little bit of difference, they're going to be the same letter. Um, thinking like tree is tree, which sounds exactly the same, doesn't it? Um, but putting in that ch instead of a tr, um then uh in math you'll see math was the most fascinating to me watching my kids it was just it's so interesting i feel like you should everybody should get to sit and try to figure out a dyslexic math problem <laughs> it's it's like it's like a brain game okay um so they might you know add one column subtract the other column flip this number replace this number with that number um uh, fives and sevens seem, tend to be a common one that they'll flip for each other um and then of course the easy ones like sixes and nines they'll flip um a three for an eight um but so you have, you know you gotta pick out like which numbers did they put in and what did they really mean versus what they wrote um, so lots, lots of fascinating things when it comes to math. Um, other things, you know, the really basic one that everybody sees is just writing letters, like, you know, writing words backward or out of order, things like that. And if that's the only thing you're saying is seeing, I would say watch and, and, and see if there's more, um, cause that can be just a normal part of their learning process as you know as they're getting through that like k through two age range um so if that's the only thing you're seeing i would say maybe they're not so um but usually if you're seeing that along with any of these other things that we're seeing we're talking about probably yes you're dealing with dyslexia um so tools this is the good stuff right so lots of tools the first thing i would say here, let me see if I can make this go away. Ah. Okay. Um, the first thing I would say is read the book Dyslexia Toolkit for Tutors and Parents. What to do when phonics isn't enough. It's by Ivana and Altogram. If you go on um, Amazon, it's on Kindle Unlimited for free. So if you happen to have Kindle Unlimited, it's a free book you can download. Um, it is probably the most encouraging book I've ever read about dyslexia. I loved it. Um, my husband read it really quickly. He hates reading, so um, but he read it in just a couple hours. Um, it's a great book. And when we were at the point when we were just, you know, beyond frustrated, all I have was getting was blank stares trying to teach um, my my first one that's dyslexic. Um, this book. Like saved us right in the middle of the book they have a quick um 
like set up for how to do a tutoring session for kids. And we actually, the, the year that I figured out that Ingrid was dyslexic, we chucked every bit of curriculum. She had no standardized curriculum at all to start with. Um, and we used that little tutoring session and it had just like basically four components to it. I want to say, um, you do, we, we did like five minutes of physical exercise and then we, the, they did, um, games. They want you to play games with them. And we'll go over some of those in just a second here. Um, but playing games. So we would sit and play one of our dyslexia games and then we would work on sight words. That's all we worked on. Like, let's just learn sight words. <laughs> and, um, and then um, after that, we would read together. And, you, and they tell you about how to um, start reading. So you start by uh, reading with tracking. So get, it, get their finger on the page. And I don't know how, many, how much she fought me on this. She still fights with me some about it. But get their finger on the page and make them follow the word because that's the only way they're going to keep it in order. Um, they need to have their finger on that page tracking underneath the, the letters. And then what you, you do is you kind of start by just having them track along while you read it. And then you track along and, and then you make them occasionally read the word. So you read along and then you pause and then they're supposed to read the word that you're on. And then you work on more and more where they're doing some of the reading. Um, and, and you're filling in the blanks. So it's just kind of like transitioning to them reading from the page, but you pick those words that they already know, you know, give them some easy wins. Um, so, um, but yeah, that, that definitely read that book. Amazing tools in that book and lots and lots of encouragement. Um, I wanna say it's Alta that is dyslexic um, and it's a mother daughter. Um, so anyways, read that. Next thing, um, Dyslexia Games Workbooks. Uh, these are great little workbooks and I'll show them to you here in just a minute. I, I put a bunch of stuff on Amazon so I could show you guys. Um, but Dyslexia Games Workbooks uh, Series A is probably the most helpful. They have multiple series. I wanna say they have like A, B and C series. There might be a D series. Um, but series A, I feel like once we finished series A, we had gotten a ton of the benefit out of that. Um, they're pretty expensive little workbooks. They're definitely reimbursable. I want to say they're like 29, almost 30 bucks a piece, something like that. Um, but amazing. Um, and what they do is it's, it looks just like a fun coloring book, kind of, sort of, um, but it makes them work on pattern identification. So to them, like I said, words are just pictures. There's, you know, these letters grouped together and that's just a picture and you can flip it lots of different ways and it's still just the same picture, right? So that means it could be lots of different words. Um, but these workbooks help them to start picking apart little bits of patterns so that that helps their brain to make those connections. So then when they're looking at words, they can pick out the letters and not just this big word picture. Um, so it's really helpful. It's also relaxing and it helps them to focus. So these are a great um, tool to have them sit down and do before you do something that they hate, okay? Or in the middle even, uh, because it'll just help them to refocus their brain and kind of decrease their frustration level. And also it helps to make those connections. And so it definitely helped, you know, starting with that and then jumping into language arts um, their brain is more ready and they're less frustrated and they're calm walking into it. So it's just a really awesome tool. Um, let's see, I already kind of talked about learning sight words, um, but learn the sight words, which is very counterintuitive. It's not the first thing you hear when you think about dyslexia because phonics is your best friend, right? Um, and that's so true, but they need the sight words because it'll decrease their frustration. Um, so if they can learn some basics, then when they're trying to read a sentence, they're not stuck on and, the, for, his. You know, they're not having to sound out those little words that it would be so handy if they just knew, okay? Um, you want them to work on those big words, right? The ones with a few more letters. Um, let them use their phonics on those words. Um, because what I found is before we learned the sight words, she could sound out a lot of things, but 
by the time she got to the end of that sentence with seven or eight words in that sentence, she was lost. She had no idea what the sentence was about because she forgot because she took 20 minutes to sound out those seven words, you know? So they just need those little easy wins. They need those little easy words mixed in there so that they can get the overall idea so they don't just despise reading. So that's where it, it is a little counterintuitive, um, but I would make sure that they're learning those. And there's lots of resources out there. Uh, we just picked a, a workbook that said, you know, like learn 100, like 100 easy sight words to learn or something like that. Um, so just find the, the lists are pretty basic. Any, any workbook that you come up with that has um, like a, a, around 100 sight words, you're going to get the same thing. And, um, and that'll just help them to be able to have a little more speed in their reading. So next thing, games are amazing. Play lots of games, okay? Um, so there, set is a brand name, but also a, a game. Um, so set, snap it up, five crowns, quiddler. There's junior versions of those games, um, but definitely check those out. These do the same kind of thing that the dyslexia games workbooks do. It just helps them to start picking up patterns um, and being able to pull apart words into letters. Um, so it's just making those different connections in their brain. What we know about dyslexia is that, you know, whereas most, most readers are using their left brain to read, dyslexic readers are using, are, they're more right brain heavy. And so what we need to do is build the connection from the right to the left brain so that they can use their strengths to learn to read, okay? Okay. So you playing these games and things help to build those connections so that they can use, like I said, their, their strengths, their tools on their right side of the brain to connect so that they can um, build their, their language skills in their left side. Okay. So they need that, they need that cross. Um, and then that goes with the next thing on here, exercise. So this sounds silly, but it totally works. Um, because we're trying to make those connections from one side of the brain to the other, um, cross body exercises are super helpful. Um, just simple stuff that, you know, basically, I mean, you can just Google search cross body exercises and anything you see on there is going to be helpful. Um, we did a lot of like squats where they would start with, you know, airplane arms. And then as they squatted down, they were crossing their arms across their body and reaching for their sides. Um, you know, and we, if we were super frustrated, we'd stop in the middle of whatever we were doing and do 10 squats like that. You know, um, if they needed to just calm down a minute, uh, my favorite um, is you, uh, you, and I'm not sure what this is called. I can't remember where I found it initially, um, but you have them stand up, they cross their legs and plant their feet. Um, and then you have them bring their, I don't know if you guys can see me too on the screen, but you have them bring their hands together in here. Let me see if I can just, how's that? Can you guys see me? Yeah, okay. So you have them put their hands together like this, grip, spin up and hold it here. Okay, so you're crisscrossing like everything, okay? You got your legs crisscrossed, you got your arms crisscrossed, your fingers crisscrossed, um, and you just sit there like that for a few minutes. And it's amazing how much it helps. Um, so definitely, like, I, I would suggest doing that. Um, I know it sounds silly and it sounds like a little, little voodoo, but it works, okay? Um, so definitely cross-body exercises. Let me see here. Okay, so next thing, curriculum. Um, so I'm gonna start with language arts curriculum. My favorite is the logic of English. That's just the one I like. There are some other ones out there that also use the Orton-Gillingham method, but that's what you wanna look for is that Orton-Gillingham method. Um, it's great for all learning styles. So, you know, I mean, I use this with all of my kids, not just the ones that are dyslexic, um, but it's specifically good for dyslexic kids because it uses that multi-sensory approach. Um, they've got things like sanded letter cards, uh, lots of games, Remember, games are good, okay? There's lots of games. Um, there's up and moving activities and games. Um, we always used, we use the boogie boards 
so they can, you know, write an erase. And I might even use that for my like whiteboard. Um, I just use that and, and then I give it back to them so they can use it, okay? Um, you can also use uh, the little whiteboards. They actually sell them with the curriculum, I think, still. Um, you can also, if you're super creative and okay with messes, um, you can write in sand, you can write in shaving cream, whipped cream, you know, all kinds of different things. Uh, but you want them to use their hands. Um, the way I learned was writing in the air and I have made all of my kids do it. And I feel like that really helps build connections because it uses their big body, big body movements. So you, you get them like big arm in the air, writing their letters in the air. Um, and do that, you know, every time they're learning a new letter, if they're learning a new uh, phonogram, so, you know, groups of letters, have them write it in the air and say it out loud, say the sounds, say the letters, do it over and over, do it, you know, you, when we learn a new phonogram, we would write it in the air five to 10 times every time. Um, and then you know, we'd get kind of annoyed by it, but it works. So it works, do it. Um, and like I said, if you're okay with messes, you can do it other ways. Um, I, I don't love messes, so I was not as good at that. Um, they're also, with the Logic of English curriculum, there's an optional extra that I would say definitely you should try to get. Um, it's called the Essentials Reader. Um, and this is basically the same exact thing that they're going to do in the schools. If you, you know, I had Ingrid in the, in a reading group for a while with her neighborhood school, and this is what they were doing. Okay. So what it does is it, it gives them a passage that they're supposed to read over and over and over and over for the week. Um, and it only utilizes words that they already know how to read. So it's never going to be something too difficult. It's not going to push them past what they know. Um, it's exactly in line with the lessons in the curriculum. Um, and then it's going to make them do some like reading comprehension stuff with it. There's some um, copy work that goes with it. Um, but it basically, it just uses the same words over and over and over and over again. Um, and it lets them practice and get that um, confidence with that passage and those words. Um, so it's a really great tool. Like I said, that's, that's basically what they're doing in the school district. If you put them in for, for reading help, this is a big thing that they would be doing. Um, so there are, I, I will warn you, there's lots of pieces to the curriculum, um, but that's, Honestly, that's just part of it. Any curriculum for language arts that's going to be good for a dyslexic kid is going to have some moving parts. They need a multi-sensory approach, like absolutely. Um, so you're going to have to do a little bit more activity-wise. You're going to, you know, get involved with your curriculum. Um, but really, in comparison, like I looked at doing Seeing Stars with Ingrid, I would don't recommend it. <laughs> okay, um, so there are some the really big language arts curriculum um, that are that use Orton Gillingham. The really big ones, you basically you really need a degree to use them. There you can get a degree <laughs> to use them, um, and you would need it. There are so many parts to it, um, and it's so tricky and so repetitive. Um, I would just feel like the logic of English takes that and it brings it down to a homeschool level for us. So I, I just love it. Some people love, um, you know, all about reading, all about spelling. Um, I just liked it that the logic of English had everything in one big, one, one curriculum, um, all put together for you. So that's my plug on that one. Um, for math, really, I'm not married to any curriculum here. Uh, the big thing you need is manipulatives. I'm going to say that over and over. Manipulatives, manipulatives. That is the thing, okay? Um, so personally, I like, we use Singapore for the younger grades, and then we move to Saxon um, after um, we do Singapore for kindergarten first and the second grade curriculum, and then we jump to math five, four, and Saxon. That's what I've found works. Um, and because Singapore for the younger grades, just lets you really quickly teach them, you know, add, subtract, multiply, divide over and over and over again. Um, and it kind of brings in the other concepts of, um, you know, shapes and time and all that kind of stuff. But it just buzzes through those basic, uh, basic math functions. And, but really, whatever you choose, the big thing you need is 
manipulatives, okay? They have to do this with their hands. Um, so, and they have to be able to see it and touch it and, and understand how it's working. Um, and then the logical part of their brain can take it from there. Um, so we use fraction circles, math blocks. Um, I have place value flip books. I've got, you know, little um, zero to 100 math sheets. Um, there's another book on here, do-it-yourself homeschooling multiplication games. That's a fun one. It just helps them to write over and over and color and, you know, play with their multiplication tables. Um, there's another game, Making Numbers Snap. Um, so that's a great one for learning multiplication tables. Um, they also have an addition one. Um, but yeah, make them play with math a little bit and get them really solid in those, in those basic math functions. Um, and this is the way to do it. Lots and lots of manipulatives. Uh, when I started teaching long division to Ingrid, I had, I think, I had like over a hundred math blocks, like the little snap together ones. And we would put a bunch of them in a bag and we would divide them that way. First, we had to divide out the, the um, you know, the hundreds. And then we would divide out the ones that were in groups of 10. And then we did divide out the ones that were singles in the bag. Um, so really like, you know, your kid can drive this, you know, you know, how far you have to go with the manipulatives. We went pretty far, okay? Uh, we touched and felt all the math, <laughs> but, but it really worked. Um, she, I would say she's excellent at math. Um, and um, yeah, just let them drive how much they need as far as that goes, but definitely get hands on your math. Um, word problems, I feel like are the most frustrating thing. And I feel like they're hard for all kids. Word problems just aren't very fun, okay? But you give that to a dyslexic kid, like they're gonna have trouble reading it to start with. And then once they do get it read, they forgot what it started with and they can't find the number words in this. And you know, and now they're trying to figure out what kind of functions to do with it. Like they're totally lost. Um, so please help them. Don't feel bad about helping them. Um, you know, read the problem to them. This is not a reading exercise. This is a math exercise. So read it to them, um, you know, and then help them find those words. So what we learned to do was we would circle number words and we would write the number above it, you know, like find those little things so that that's a tool they can use later on. You don't have to be sitting there with them for them to remember that tool and remember like, oh, when I see a written word, I need to, a written number, I need to write down the, the actual digit, you know, and that'll just help them. They still do that on all their tests. Um, they, they look and as we read through the word, the word problems, they go back and they're writing the numbers, circling them um, so that they, then when they get to the end and they figure out the pattern that they're using, they have the tools to go back and actually do the math problem. So, and you can find what works, you know, for your kids, just because it worked for mine doesn't mean it's going to work for yours, uh, but definitely help them figure out how they can tackle those word problems. Um, that's one thing I love about Saxon is they are really big on teaching them patterns. Um, you know, look for these kind of words when they, when you see the word difference or when you see groups, um, you know, this is the kind of math direction you're going to go in. Um, and we talked about that with Ingrid a lot, like, okay, think about your tools, like which tools are you going to use for this math problem? You know, what is it pointing you toward? Um, and don't be afraid to do math out loud. Okay. So don't get locked into having to see the work on the paper, um, especially in the younger grades, um, work with them. Don't, don't let math become something they hate just because they hated reading. Okay. Um, so definitely don't be afraid to do it out loud. Um, kind of my rule around here with kids is if you got the answer right, I don't have to see your work. If you got it wrong, then I have to see your work. Um, so they know, take your time, get it right. If you want to not write it down. Um, and that just, it gives them some easy wins because a lot of times they are really good at math um, and they can do it in their heads um, and they can buzz through some things and that's okay. Let them have that win. And then when it comes to the long division and they have to write it out, then at least they didn't have to write down that stupid addition problem that they did in their head, <laughs> you know? All right, so again, oral work is your friend. Um, don't let reading result in a struggle for every subject, okay? So feel free to do things 
things out loud. Um, you know, don't don't stress over having work samples. You know, let let them just learn. Um, like I said, use your tools. I, I mean, I still don't read a textbook to learn information, and I'm almost 40. So, um, you know, so just do what works. You know, if if they can learn history by listening to an audiobook, awesome. Can they tell you about it? Great. Then, do they need to write a big thing about it? No. Did you did you accomplish your goal? Great. So, um, definitely don't don't get bogged down in every subject just because they have this one struggle. Um, I would I would just encourage you in that it lets them feel smart. They you know they are smart kids and they can learn a ton of things. So let them feel smart in all the other areas. <laughs> okay. All right. And then this is a little bit about the auditory portion of dyslexia. Um, learn to say things differently. So I don't know how many times I I looked at a teacher or my mom and said I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> um, and my kids now say the same thing to me. Okay. So when they say that, definitely like stop and think and come at it from a brand new angle. Don't, don't beat the same dead horse. Um, just so you, you have to find some other way around it. Um, and sometimes that means getting somebody else to explain it to them. Um, because some of this is, um, just their ability to connect concepts to words. Um, maybe the words that you're using or the way that you're coming at it is not making a connection for them. Um, and the reason why that is, is that dyslexic kids kind of, we hit on this kind of in the first couple of slides talking about, you know, them hearing sounds um, and thinking that they're the same sound. Um, they can have a, a, a trouble just, um, picking out sounds, identifying words, differentiating things. Um, they can get really stuck on, you know, semantics and colloquialisms, idioms, or idioms. Um, if you, you know, be clear and, and be concise and be concrete whenever you can um, and use words and ideas that they already understand. Um, you know, try to use common things that they do every day, especially in, in math and stuff. If you can, if you can help them to understand something from, from something they enjoy, like my, um, uh, Ingrid loves cooking. So anytime she gets frustrated with math, cooking comes out. <laughs> okay. Um, we talk about cooking, we talk about baking, we talk about how she's going to do math in her restaurant one day. Um, so we come up with all kinds of different ways to help um, solidify concepts with something that they already like or are interested in. Um, but definitely, I feel like this is probably the most confusing part of dyslexia for me even, um, is just this whole idea that um, sometimes they're just not hearing it the same way that you're saying it, or they're trying to, like they're hearing the words that you're saying, but those words are not matching up and they're having trouble making that left right connection from what you're saying to that um, that logical part of the process that they're trying to access. So just come at it with new words, come at it from a new angle, um, pull out a different manipulative um, and or you know get another part of their body working to try to come up um, with a connection for them. So don't I don't know this is like I said probably the most confusing part of dyslexia for me um, but just I wanted to kind of throw it in here so that you could think about that, that it's not always the written items. Um, they might really be having a hard time coming up with that connection from the word you're using to what they're thinking of, about or supposed to be thinking about um, that they understand already. So, um, the, did you notice something? Anything jump out? Lots of colors. <laughs> so, lots of colors, different fonts, uh, backgrounds. You'll see that um, dyslexic kids definitely um, can benefit from reading text in different colors and fonts. Um, specifically, if you look at the word did on this page, um, that is in dyslexy font, which I put the little link on the page there for you. So dyslexy font, um, it was designed specifically because um, what they did is they made it hard to reverse the letters. So if you'll notice the D looks pretty different. Um, 
Let me see. I'm going to find a page where I used it on here. Oh, well, gift. So a gift. That is, you can see that they're like fatter letters at the top, of, you know, that's fatter at the bottom. So it's not going to look the same if you flip that word over. Um, and so they just, they created it just to help us dyslexic people. And I feel like it's actually really good. I've downloaded it onto my Kindle. You can download it. You can make your entire computer screen flip to dyslexy font so that you can read any web page in that font. Um, and it can really help with tired eyes uh, flipping things around. Uh, but yeah, definitely colors. You, they even make overlays that you can put over um, text to make it more easily readable. And usually a kid has their own color that works the best for them that really keeps their eyes from being super tired uh, reading different things. And then last, um, it's okay to be behind. Okay, remember, I didn't read till I was like, really, you know, fifth and sixth grader. Um, and that's okay. And I still hated it for a long, long time. Okay. Um, and and I'm, I'm still a functioning human. <laughs> so uh, don't, don't worry if you get behind, um, just keep plugging away at it. Slow and steady is what wins the race. Um, and at one day, you really will look back and you'll realize like, Oh my goodness, they just were read that like really difficult passage. What? <laughs> I didn't think they would ever read. Um, and they're and they're just picking up these words, like, you know. Um, so you'll get there. One day that's what that'll happen. So just keep plugging away at it. And that is all I had. So do you guys have questions? Oh, you know what? I forgot. I say that's all I had, but I was gonna show you guys. Um, let's see. I'm show you guys my Amazon cart here. Here we go. Okay, so pictures of tools. So here's the dyslexia toolkit. Um, here's some pictures, some manipulatives. Um, I definitely like the uh, place value chart and most of them have decimals on the flip side of it. So it's, it's just really nice as you're teaching them um, more about numbers. Um, the base 10 is really great. Um, this right here is what I was saying. I had over a hundred of these trying to teach long division. So these are a great tool. Uh, right, fraction circles. We can't see Sorry. your screen. Oh, oh. no. It's because you opened a new window. Oh. You can still see the PowerPoint. But we okay. Hold on one second. Let me see. How about now? Yay! Okay. Here, I'll go back to the top then. There we go. Okay, so this is the dyslexia toolkit for parents and tutors. Um, flip chart for place value, uh, your base 10. And then these, this is what I was pointing to that we had over a hundred of these little click together Lego blocks. Um, fraction circles are really great. We use those all the time. Um, this is just some pictures of uh, the Singapore map. I love how colorful, the kindergarten ones are super colorful. So if anybody has little kids, those are really nice for kindergarten and preschool. Um, games, here's the some of those five crowns, junior, five crowns. This is, is the multiplication games book I was telling you about. That one has um, lots of the, um, like basically they can write them and color them over and over. Um, so I love it for learning the multiplication tables. This is the dyslexia games workbook. Um, and this is the very first one of series A. Um, and so you can kind of see, like this is the kind of pattern stuff that they'll do in the book. Um, in fact, let me just see if they'll show us. Oh look, see I bought the first one in 2015. <laughs> let me see if it'll show you a couple of pages out of this one. here lots of lots of different um, pattern fixing 
So this might seem like a silly game, but basically what they're making them do is pick out exactly what's different and then rewrite it. And they're using some letters, some just pictures, um, and they're flipping things and they're making them pay attention to which direction things are flipped. Um, so like that's this, this top row that you can see here. Um, they're having to pay attention to what direction things are. Um, and they'll have them rotate items on the page, like color the next one and find the different pattern where it's spinning because that keeps them, that then they start paying attention to the fact that things are in different directions. So when they're looking at that B and P, they can't just flip that. They notice that it's pointing a different direction. It's a different thing. So, see if I can go back. Uh, where's my cart? Okay. Go back here. All right, more games. Quiddler, Quiddler Jr. Set. Set is such a great game. I definitely would recommend um, get this one or get Set Jr. if you've got littler kids. Um, these Snap It Up games are awesome. The kids really like those. Yeah, and all of those things are, um, like all of them are reimbursable items. You can purchase them all with your allotment. Um, so these are all things that you guys could get. Anybody have questions? Anybody? No? Okay, well, I mean, that's, that's I all I have a question have. for you. Yeah. Okay, so I, my son is going into possibly junior high next year. And um, what, do you have any suggestions for taking in information like lectures, et cetera, and then processing that and getting that down on paper? Because a lot of times he has a hard time writing out multiple sentences quickly and processing all that information. We've tried mind maps, um, but getting large amounts of information down quickly. Any suggestions? You know what? Um, I mean, everybody is different, but um, if you can pick out, like, what are his learning styles? Do you He's know? He's a visual learner. He likes manipulatives. Um, he likes projects. So we tend to do a lot more project-based stuff versus writing papers. But mm -hmm. if he does eventually someday go back to public school, not soon, but if he does, that's one of the things I think he'll really struggle with is if teachers expect you to write down a lot of notes. Right now we're able to, st I can stop if I'm talking to him or mm -hmm. if say it's crash course, uh, like a YouTube, he can pause it and write stuff down. Yeah, um, honestly, I would say, and this is where like a lot of this is from my personal experience, right? Um, what saved me in, in lecture was I sometimes wouldn't write notes. I would just sit back and listen um, because I could take in a ton of information if I would just sit back and let it, let it kind of sink in. Um, I only took notes as far as it was helpful to keep me focused. Um, so, you know, writing little bits, um, you know, even drawing a picture about what they're saying. Um, you know, if they were talking about the heart, I'd start drawing a picture of a heart, you know, and, and start writing like, like drawing the flow and things like that. So anything, you know, if he can write pictures of what he's hearing um, or just, you know, you know, see, and you can test this out this year, you know, see what works as far as helping, having him um, just write down, like really notes, most of what they're going to teach you is, is in the book, right? So like you don't, don't, he shouldn't ever need to write out the whole lecture. Um, you know, you can tape a lecture and listen to it again later, or just, you know, if they really want you writing something, then figure out what helps them to, to listen best, really. You know, is it going to be helpful to write a, draw a picture about what they're saying or, or just write some of the words, you know, maybe keywords that he hears. Um, keywords that he wants to remember because then he can look up that word, you know, um, and find more information about it um, at home. I don't know, does that seem, does that help at all? 
It does help and it's reassuring because right now he does listen and he takes in quite a bit, but because yeah. we don't learn the same way, I'm always nervous that, that I'm not providing enough um, feedback later after that information is gone. I want him, yeah. but he can, re his recall is pretty good. Good. The second question I have is about organization. My concern is, and I have to say homeschool has been a complete blessing for us because yeah. we can go at his speed. It's been wonderful. But should he be in a position in college or junior high or whatnot where he has multiple classes with multiple expectations and time management, et cetera, what were some of the tools that you used to keep everything straight? Because we've done a hundred, at least when he used to be in public school, he's done a ton of calendar type schedules to keep him straight. And he just doesn't write in it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know what? Uh, goodness, the more simple, the better. Um, I never used weekly anything. It had to be on a month um, because it had to be all in one place and much more simple. Um, and I had nightmares all the time that I was going to miss an entire class for a semester or something that I would just never go to that class. Um, you know, um, so yes, it's tricky. It's hard to do. Um, but if I would say keep it as simple as possible um, and keep things maybe color coded. Um, because the same kind of thing, you know, if he can write in like his work schedule, you know, in one color and classes in a different color and have more of like a standard week kind of deal, you know, off to the side where he can say like every Monday I have this, every Tuesday I have that, every Wednesday this. Um, so kind of a picture of the week that is never changing. Um, that he doesn't have to write in and, and keep writing the same thing over and over. And then the month as a big hole so that, um, cause the, yeah, the less, the better you want one big picture that you can look at, not a bunch of little items everywhere. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I would have to say one other thing about when I was in college, the number one thing that helped me is I would sit and listen to lecture and then I would go and teach it to my friends. So we would have a study group and I would go and I would be the one that's sitting there being like, oh, remember it's this and this and this and this and just reteaching it. Like I could spit back half of the lecture to my friends in study group and then I had it nailed down. You know, by the time I re did that repetition out loud. So if you can maybe even have him come back and try to teach you what he learned or teach a sibling what he learned, um, that'll nail it down even better more, way more valuable than written notes. Thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, anybody I'd else? Love, I'd love to chime in really quickly too. So yeah. my name is Megan Schneider. I'm a sponsor teacher with Family Partnership. Yeah. I'm also dyslexic. So oh, nice. also, I also went through my entire um, personal education with dyslexia. I was homeschooled by my parents and um, obviously went through college with dyslexia mm -hmm. as well. So I've got, I've nice. got the self gain. <laughs> I loved that. That was a huge piece of success and learning about how to process patterns. It was all really helpful. I, I resonate so much with what was discussed here. Um, <clears throat> so it's really exciting to be in the workshop and hear about this and get excited about sharing that with others. For my college experience, I felt very prepared for college just by how we had had the flexibility to work with my own learning style in homeschool. So, um, and audio are great. We didn't, I guess maybe they existed well when I was a kid, but we didn't have them. So my mom would read our science textbook out loud in high school because that was our version of an audiobook. And I would say if you're looking at um, kind of concerned with keeping up notes for lectures, another two pieces of advice I would add is talk to the teacher or professor, talk to the individual giving the less lecture every time and that will tell them you mean business you're not goofing off you are working on learning and you want to know and you can talk to them and say how serious are notes how much are you going to be talking about things that aren't in the textbook how much can i just listen how good are you at writing things on the board if i just copy what you write on the board and you let my mind focus on what you're saying is that if, if you have that conversation at the beginning of a class with a teacher they will understand where you're coming from and you'll be able to know how much 
work you have to put into something that doesn't naturally connect with you. And then the retelling afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so I would I would suggest maybe looking into some symbiotic relationships with other students. Maybe someone's really good at taking notes, but they mm -hmm. just feed through and write. If you guys can meet up and you can get a chance to go over their notes, but you can do the verbal telling back to them and that will connect and bring that auditory piece that they may have zoned out on in their note writing. That can actually be really beneficial for both. That's collaborative. That's building skills for college, for the workplace. That's another way to be working on that. And then also you can always see if you can record lectures. I know that's twice the work having to listen to it two times. But sometimes for some of those lectures where, yes, you are going to have to take detailed notes, that might be where you've talked to that person, you know that's coming up, and you might need to see if you can record those lectures and go over it at your own pace at a later time. So those are my additions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else questions? I have a question. Any games, um, apps for the phone or um, um, iPad? I don't know. I really stayed away from it because it's harder to see it and touch it. Um, I feel like it doesn't, it doesn't fulfill so much of that multi-sensory. Um, yeah, um, but there are some. So the Logic of English actually has an app where they can get in there and practice the sounds. I would say that one's helpful because it breaks down the phonograms and it has them, um, you know, they, they say it and, they, and then they have to pick it out on the screen. Um, so that's a good one because it works on that auditory portion for them. Um, so definitely that's, that's a good one. Um, other than that, we just haven't really used the, um, yeah. Because I feel like they zone out more than they get much from it. So that's my personal experience. So yeah. I know some people have better experience with it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? All right. Well, I don't want to keep you guys hanging out on here. So um, if you come up with other questions, um, you can always email me. My email is pretty easy. It's in the mountains at hotmail.com. So it's the word I N underscore T H E underscore mountains at hotmail.com. Um, you guys can email me your questions. If you don't hear back from me pretty quickly, um, then like email again, because it probably got lost. <laughs> so it's not that I saw it and didn't care. <laughs> like, um, so I, I'm always happy to answer questions or, you know, see if I can point you at a tool that worked for us. Um, so definitely um, anytime you can email me, you can also text um, 907-227-0914 and that's going to be a lot quicker. So if you're desperate, <laughs> go ahead and um, text me. But I know it can be super frustrating. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you so much for all the info. We appreciate it. Yeah. Yes, you are a wealth of information. I learned so much and my Amazon cart is going to be a lot fuller because of it. So. <laughs> oh, I already bought four things. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, thank you, Liz. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me.